So good morning, everyone. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you on behalf of myself and our associate pastor, Kathleen Stoles, and uh, the whole congregation. We're grateful that you're here this morning, that you've come to worship uh, with us, and that you're sharing your morning with us. I hope that each one of you will take a moment. There's a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. I hope that you'll pass it down so that each person uh, who's seated on the row with you can uh, take some time to share with us uh, their name, let us know that you've been here. And especially if you're visiting with us, if you'd be willing to take the time to fill out the bottom part of the page where there's a space for your uh, contact information, we'd love to be able to put you on our weekly mailing list so you get our weekly email and then also our uh, monthly newsletter. So we hope that you'll give us the opportunity to do that and let you know about things that are going on here at the church. A couple of announcements as we are getting ready to uh, move into worship. The first one is a note about next week's schedule. Next week is Confirmation Sunday and Pentecost Sunday. And I expect that uh, at the 11 o'clock service, it's going to be pretty full. So a couple of options. You might consider either attending one of the other services. All three of the services are going to be in the sanctuary next week. They're all going to look the same. We're going to be doing confirmation at all three services. But there will be the, mo the largest number of, of confirmation families will be in the 11 o'clock service. So you might want to give that some consideration. And if you, um, if you are totally committed to coming at 11 o'clock, then it might be a wise idea to come early, okay? Just say it, okay? So uh, as we go into next week, I hope that you'll give that some consideration. The second thing uh, that I want to lift up is the chicken barbecue, going to be happening on June the 10th. And so this is a fundraiser the United Methodist men do um, in order to support their mission and their ministry. And so we hope that you'll come out for that. You have the choice of either a chicken uh, or a, a uh, pulled pork, and I think uh, Burton it does the pulled pork, and uh, Burton is very good at doing pulled pork. So if that's something you're interested in, he would love to help you out with that as well. So um, that's going to be taking place in uh, two, two, two Saturdays from now, and you can buy tickets after worship. You can also uh, buy tickets uh, online as well up through June 4th. So we encourage you to take a look at that. It's a fun time and a great food. Last thing that I want to share with you is uh, Kathleen and I, along with uh, Logan Crossan, our uh, director of uh, contemporary music, were all at the uh, annual conference along with our lay members, uh, Donna Howe and Leslie Conegetter. And uh, we had the opportunity to celebrate, and our theme this year was Rejoice. So we brought back a video. This video is a little recap of everything that, uh, everything that we did at the annual conference. So we invite you to uh, take a look at it. All right, nice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Over these next couple of days, we're going to be talking about rejoicing. Rejoicing in all that God has done for us. All that God will do for us. And all that God is doing right now for us. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Back in 2013, we set a new strategic direction for our ministry together. And over the past four years, we have realigned and focused our resources to recruit and develop transformational spiritual leaders to make disciples of Jesus Christ and grow vital congregations to change lives and transform communities here in GNJ and around the world. We see the Spirit expanding our imaginations, opening us to new possibilities, giving us the wisdom to address our challenges with creativity, and granting us the courage to lead forward towards a future of hope for the United Methodist Church of Greater New Jersey. We rejoice with the things the Lord will do. I intend to keep GNJ together as one conference, a place where orthodox and progressive and middle viewpoints can thrive and grow, where liberals and conservatives can draw upon their rich understandings and traditions to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This will be a significant challenge but let joy be our aim, not happiness. Joy in diversity, not happiness in uniformity.
So if you've never attended an annual conference, I think that that gives a, a, pretty, good, <clears throat> a pretty good impression of what the whole time is about. We spend a lot of time talking about the mission and ministry that we're doing. We spend a lot of time celebrating and including celebrating with some of those who are uh, newly commissioned and ordained. And this year we had the chance to celebrate some folks that you all know. Um, John Inverso, who uh, served as one of our student associate uh, pastors here, uh, was ordained, as was uh, Catherine Williams, who was also uh, serving here at one point. And we also recognize the orders of Don Corlew. So Don uh, was one of our associate pastors, and uh, she was recognized and became a full member of the United Methodist Church. So we're really excited uh, to, to be able to celebrate with all of those. And one of the joys that we are able to announce is that Pastor Kathleen and I have both been uh, reappointed to this church uh, for the next year. So that's a good thing. It's always good to come back and know that you still have a job. It's excellent, and uh, we're excited about that. And we're uh, happy to be with you all again for another year. So Kathleen, will you lead us in the call to worship? We forgot to mention at the other two services, we also had a youth representative yeah, there. That. Yes, yeah. yes. So Haynes Hoag was with us this year. He's been with us a couple of years and uh, previous years. Alana Miller's been with us. So there's a strong youth presence there as well, which is always good to bring one, some of our young people with us. So. Paul Barnett actually had the opportunity. That's right. Paul Barnett was there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, had, you were well represented at Med Medford. Yeah, really good. Would you uh, please rise now and join me in our call to worship? From James 3, 17 and 18, let us hear these words. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. So, so come, come, let us, let us worship, worship the God of wisdom, wisdom of, of justice, justice, and, and of peace. peace. <laughs>
seated. And I invite you now to join me in our opening prayer. O oh Lord God, today we are called to be peacemakers, but we are unfit for the task. By nature, we are peace fakers and peace breakers, so we need help ourselves. Cleanse us from our own sin, so that we will not add to the problems of others. Take the logs from our eyes, so we can help others remove the specks from theirs. Fill us with your spirit, so we may produce good fruit, your fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. Please join me in our words of assurance. I will sing about the wonders of your love forever, O God. I will proclaim your faithfulness to everyone I meet, young and old. For your merciful love lasts forever, as constant as the heavens above. Blessed are those who trust in you, who walk in the light of your presence. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Let's take a moment to greet those around us with the peace of Christ. So I know we have a few children. Would anyone like to come up and join me? Well, I can come to you then. <laughs> because we're talking today, this is Memorial Day weekend, so we're talking about memories and remembering what um, all those who have gone before, especially those this weekend who have given us the country that we have to live in and, um, and we give thanks for all of those who have given their lives. But if we go back into scripture to think about memories and memorials, we find the story of Joshua. And when Joshua and the people of Israel joined, went across the Jordan River into the Promised Land, we don't remember so often that that Jordan River parted just like the Red Sea had parted. Sometimes we don't remember that part of the story. So the Jordan River parted, and when it parted, Joshua said, I want you to get 12 stones from the middle of the river to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So I didn't bring 12 stones. But very often what happens in scripture is people pick up rocks, and then they build a little tower, a little monument. Might be an altar but a place to remember God's presence in their lives. So when they crossed the Jordan River, they took 12 stones out of the river and then they placed them on the, on the bank to remember what had happened, what God had done in their lives, and they gave thanks. So perhaps when you've been walking paths, hikes along the way, you may have seen some piles of stones, something like that, and very often, it's a tradition that people still do. They stop in a place that's memorable to them, and they place a little pile of stones. Maybe you've done it. Maybe you've seen it done. 
So those are special places, and sometimes in the Celtic tradition we might call them thin places, where God comes down and we remember God's presence in our lives and we give thanks. So we give thanks this week and then we remember those who have gone before us and we give thanks to God. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We'll read it responsively, and halfway through, the, uh, the dynamic will change, so please be mindful of that and, uh, and follow along on the screens. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful. For they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. So this is the last week for our series on the Beatitudes, the series, the series that we've called Happy. And I hope that over the course of these last several weeks that you've come to a deeper appreciation of the Beatitudes. And I wanted uh, to share 
us to have us share together in the reading responsibly today so that we might continue to have these words embedded in our hearts and in our minds. And the Beatitudes are meant to challenge us. They're meant to surprise us. They are meant to shock us. And today, I want us to take um, one more step through the Beatitudes and look at two that I think are closely related. The first one being, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And then the second one being, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Two that I think uh, bear on what we are about as a nation on this particular weekend in our life. And so let's take a moment as we get started. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for the scripture that's been read. We thank you for the words of Jesus and for his message and for his life, for his death and for his resurrection. And we give you thanks that this morning you can be at work and you are at work all around us. And we pray that we might hear a word from you here this morning. We pray this, that, that you might be at work, whether through me or in spite of me, but that you might be at work here because your servants this morning are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, I forgive, but I don't forget. So I can't tell you how many times over the course of my ministry I've heard someone say that to me. Pastor, I forgive, but I don't forget. And every time someone says that to me, I'm always convinced that what they want, what they're fishing for, what they're looking for from me, is for me to bless that. Okay? For me to say, that's all right. And sometimes, you know what I can say in good conscience, that's all right. But the vast majority of the time, I cannot. And let me tell you why. It has to do with the way they say it. Pastor, I forgive, but I don't forget. Right? Their eyes get a little narrower. They really put an emphasis on don't, right? And I know that in that moment, what they're saying is, I've not forgiven or forgotten. Neither one of those things has taken place. But yet I'm asking you to say that's okay. Now I get the idea. I get why someone might say that. Might be looking for something to kind of ease their mind around it. Because I know that trust does take time to earn back. We shouldn't expect that when we've really screwed something up, that we can just walk right back into the relationship and pick up exactly where we left off. Nobody should expect that, because that's not how things work. Some hurts take longer to heal. In fact, some injuries will just never be forgotten. If you've been through surgery and you've had a scar, you might know that when you move in a certain way, that scar is still there. There's still a tightness there. That when you try to move, it just doesn't, your body just doesn't support it. It's not unlike the way that we react when we have an emotional hurt sometimes. We go back to that place with that person, you know what, we just can't bend that way. And yet, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. And so if you remember from the very beginning, when we, the reason why we have called this series happy is because one of the other ways to translate this word, blessed, is with the word happy. Happy are those who are merciful. So let's talk for a minute about what mercy is. Mercy is this characteristic of having the power to punish someone for something that they've done, but choosing instead to let it go. I've talked a lot as we've gone through this series about problems in translation and how difficult it is sometimes to translate ideas. And Mercy is one of these ideas that's a really big idea in the Bible that is hard for us to, to sum up with just one word. Sometimes we talk about mercy as compassion, the feeling of compassion acted upon and lived out. So this notion that 
<coughs> excuse me. So this notion that when you have this feeling that enables you to see the world, that enables you to step into someone else's shoes for a moment, and suddenly you have this realization of what it must be like for the other person. If you're able then to act out of that, if you take that knowledge, that compassion, and then act out of it, that's mercy. That's compassion played out. Now, according to the scriptures, mercy is one of the chief characteristics of who God is. So, for example, we find this in Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. and His mercies never come to an end. So if we want to learn to be like God, and after all, isn't that the goal of this life? Isn't that the point of why we're here? It's to learn every day to be a little bit more like God. Is that what we're striving for? Then we need to learn what it is to practice mercy. Now, the Lord's Prayer has the structure of mercy built right into it. So that when we pray for our sins to be forgiven, we're also praying for the capacity to forgive others. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So this idea of reciprocal mercy, you might call it, the mercy that flows first from God and then out from us who have received it, that's built into the structure of the prayer. It's one of the ways that we're asking God every time we pray that prayer that we might become more like Jesus, that we might become more like God. But there is this question of how exactly are the merciful happy? How does that come into play? Because I tend to think on some level that, well, vengeance sounds a lot more satisfying, doesn't it? It usually does. It's a lot more appealing to us to be able to see someone, even if, even if maybe we'd use the word schadenfreude, right? the idea that to see someone who deserves it, who deserves to have everything that they've done come right back upon them and then be able to sit back and say, well, you know what? They had it coming. We find that a lot more satisfying emotionally than mercy. Well, we may believe that and we may look forward to that. But it's clear somehow that God does not. So, I can't tell you how many places in Scripture that we're reminded that God not only forgives our sins, but forgets about them. So here are just three, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That's Hebrews 10. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's Micah 7. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. That's Psalm 103. So unless we really want to admit openly and honestly that we are not interested in becoming like God, it's hard for me to understand how it is that we could ever ponder the idea of forgiving without forgetting. Unless we're truly willing to admit that we're not interested in becoming like God. And that is the point of the Beatitudes, to remind us of what it means for us to become more and more like God. Now I know that we're only human, and I know that we are not capable of doing everything that God is capable of doing. We are not the Messiah. I know further that sometimes we refuse to forget in order to make sure that we ourselves can stay safe. I understand all of these things. But at the same time, we are not excused from trying to put into practice these words that Jesus speaks, even though they are hard. So there's a story that Jesus tells that illustrates this well, this idea of the mercy that comes to us, we share it. And it's from a little later in, <clears throat> in Matthew's Gospel, where he tells this story 
of a man who owes a ton of money to the king. This man owes millions of dollars. And so when the king is going to settle accounts, he calls this man in. He says, listen, I've been looking at the books. I'm not really sure what to do. You owe me a lot of money. How do you propose we solve it? The man says, well, I, I really can't pay you. I know I'm in the hole, yeah, by a lot. The king says, I'm not sure what else to do except I think you're going to have to go into prison and your family's going to have to be sold into slavery. At which point the man throws himself down and begs for mercy. And the king considers the situation, finally says, all, all right, I'm never going to get this money back anyway, so what's the difference? All right, we'll let it go. He sets the man free. So the man goes out, and he's walking down the street, he doesn't get very far, he's feeling pretty good, until he sees someone who owes him oh, a few thousand dollars, not a lot of money but enough, enough to make him angry. He takes the man, he throws him up against the wall and says, listen, where's that money you owe me? Somebody who had just come from the palace observes this whole thing going on, goes back to the king and says, do you realize what just happened? So before long, this man is dragged back before the king. The king says, what's the deal? I forgave you all of this debt. And now here you're going to demand a pound of flesh from this poor sap who owes you $1,000? At that point, the king has him thrown into prison. He says, the deal's off. You never learned how to forgive. So I've kind of forgotten how to forgive as well. The moral of the story is that those who have been shown God's mercy then are called upon to take that mercy out into the world and show it to others. It's a hard story because here forgiveness kind of becomes pointed in the wrong direction. The man who's forgiven all that debt, he forgets what's been forgiven him. Instead of forgetting that which is owed him, he forgets how much he has been, how much he himself has owed. So when we expect forget, forgiveness and forgetfulness to be extended toward us, we often find ourselves in these situations where we conveniently forget what's been extended on our behalf. So the other day, I was reminded of this. I'm going, come, I was coming back from annual conference. And I was, uh, it was late in the day. I was trying to get back in order to get Lily off the bus. I was in a hurry. I was hungry. I was tired. I was kind of grumpy. And as soon as I walked into this McDonald's, I could tell like things were kind of in chaos. You know, people in the front weren't really communicating with the people in the back. They were kind of yelling at each other. There were a lot of people standing around. Didn't look good. I placed my order, and I'm standing there for probably 10 minutes. Now, how often does that ever, how often does that ever happen in a McDonald's, right? You never wait that long in a McDonald's. But I'm standing there, and I'm waiting. And so finally woman comes to the counter and she says, I've got this, I don't know what it was, Egg McMuffin or something like that. Some kind of a breakfast thing. I'm looking around, I'm like, not mine. There are a bunch of other people that are standing there too. None of us had ordered that. Finally, she, you know, confused by it for a couple more minutes and then she says, let me see your receipt. So, she looks at my receipt. She says, this is yours. I'm like, that's not what I ordered. <laughs> I don't know if I said anything else or not. 
But I know in that moment, I was, I was, I was not a pastor who'd just come from the church meeting. <laughs> you know, I'd spent a couple days um, working behind the scenes at the annual conference, and I'd sit there with these headphones on, and I'd tell people what to do. You know, like that's my, kind of my job is to keep everything flowing. And, and I get into this situation and now where I can't tell somebody what to do, right? And it makes me angry. Now, if I had screwed up at the annual conference, I would have expected somebody to, you know, to say to me, well, you got 99% of everything right. It's okay, right? But here I wasn't willing to do that for this poor person who was on the register who clearly was being trained. Oh, he had to press the button to move from the breakfast menu to the lunch menu in order to input that order. So our forgetfulness is completely one-sided. We tend to forget what we've been forgiven just long enough and at these critical moments where we excuse ourselves from extending that forgiveness to others. You might call it a kind of selective forgetfulness. We've all practiced that, right? Selective forgetfulness. But to be merciful as God is merciful requires us to be aware of what we've been forgiven. Not to feel guilty about it, but to be aware of it, to remember it, to acknowledge it. And it requires us to keep in mind our own faults and our own potential to make mistakes. And this forgetfulness, I believe, also bears on another one of the Beatitudes, this idea of blessed are the peacemakers. We celebrate Memorial Day by honoring the sacrifice of those who have died in service to the nation. It is a day of remembrance and not a day of forgetfulness. But when we think about it, it's also true that in order to, for their sacrifices to have meant something, in order for there ever to be peace, there has to come a day when we forget enough in order to sit down across a table from someone and negotiate a way forward where we lay down our arms. We have to choose a certain level of forgetfulness as a pragmatic, practical kind of matter, at least long enough for us to be able to move forward with a relationship. Have you ever thought about this, how surprising it is, 70 years after the Second World War, that Japan and Germany are two of our greatest allies. Have you thought about how strange that is? Now, we didn't forget about Pearl Harbor. We haven't forgotten about the Battle of the Bulge. We have a Battle of the Bulge veteran with us this morning. We haven't forgotten about the Battle of Britain. Japan has not forgotten about Hiroshima. Nagasaki. But any process of peace between people and between nations relies on the idea that we'll set aside at least enough of the past to be able to say, you know what, let's move forward somehow together. To be able to trust someone long enough to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to trust that you can be trusted at least take that step. So think for a moment in terms of your personal relationships. Think about injuries that you have suffered. If we dwell only on the hurts of the past, if we allow those memories to dominate our understanding of who that person is, there is no way we can ever move forward with that relationship. We have to have at least a selective forgetfulness that allows us to go forward. 
on some front. Otherwise, there can never be peace. That's why peacemaking is such hard work. Because this selective forgetfulness, it often feels like a betrayal. It often feels like what we're doing is setting aside something that is very, very important, that we can't forget, that we shouldn't forget, that it dishonors somebody's memory by forgetting it. But somehow, some way, in order to move forward, we have to set some things aside to create a practical framework for peace. We all want to live in peace. But Jesus doesn't say, blessed are those who want to live in peace. Or blessed are those who really enjoy peace. Or even blessed are those who are peaceful. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called the children of God. Now this is a hard message in a week where we've witnessed another bombing. This is a hard message in a week where we've seen Coptic Christians, an ancient, ancient Christian community, It's being wiped out in Egypt. Mercy is not on our minds. That's the honest truth. And there are times when even Jesus cannot force us into a position where we're willing to think about mercy. We're just not ready. So mercy for the time being may have to play out in other ways. Think about in the in Manchester, there are about 10,000 uh, Libyan expatriates who live there, who came uh, largely during the Gaddafi era, and who now are settled in Manchester. So part of the challenge for that city will be to say, you know what, I recognize that not everybody who's from Libya is like this. That yes, we've experienced this terrible loss, this act of violence against us, but I don't believe that everyone in your community is like that. That too is the kind of mercy that makes for peace. So when you plan a series like this, you never know what will happen as you go through the weeks. You never know what's going to pop up in the news. It's true that the Beatitudes do not offer easy answers. To anything. But I believe in them. I believe in the Beatitudes. Not just as ideals that are to be read and looked at and then to be set aside, but as something that we're called to try to live into. I believe in that mercy that leads to forgiveness, and I believe in that forgetfulness that leads to peace. I also recognize that we are limited and that we are finite and that we will not always get it right. But I don't think that Jesus' idealism leaves us off the hook. We're not left off the hook for this. We can resist this teaching. We can say, you know what, I forgive, Pastor, but I don't forget. But the question is, what kind of world do we want to make? What kind of world do we want to live in? There's no way in any relationship that we cannot expose ourselves to some level of risk and some level of hurt. There's always this trust that we turn over to somebody else in every relationship. If they've hurt us, they may hurt us again. But God has extended this to us. And so we're called to extend it to others. Which brings us right back to the very beginning, to the first sermon. They talked about the idea that the Beatitudes are at their core an exercise in trust. That's what they're about. It's about trusting God to see us through in moments when we cannot see ourselves through. And I trust that God is at work in these words to transform us and change us. I trust that in these words we find a pathway to blessedness. I trust that in these words we find a pathway toward joy. To know what it is to be happy, truly happy. 
Amen. And you may be seated. And as we continue now, we'll offer, God, we'll offer God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
pray with me? O oh God, we give you thanks for all things, for these offerings given by your people to support your ministry, for the freedom to offer our worship in peace, for the beauty of this land and its people. Lord, we give thanks today for all those who have sacrificed much to secure these many blessings. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to pray together, I want to lift up a couple of concerns that have come uh, to me this morning. The first one is for Michelle, who's um, facing uh, partial mastectomy uh, in the coming weeks. We want to pray for Michelle. I want to pray for uh, Chip Eaton, um, Dorothy's son, who's going to be driving from California to take care of some uh, family uh, business here. Uh, so we pray for him and safe travels. I want to pray for Bill, uh, who's uh, Ann's brother who has cancer. So as we gather together here this morning, let's take these prayers and uh, the concerns of our hearts and uh, the joys of our lives as well and prepare to lay them before our Lord. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the beauty of this world that we live in. We give you thanks for the blessing of being able to uh, pray and worship together in peace and for that um, great gift of this, this freedom that you have given us and that has been secured by the sacrifice of so many. Lord, we remember those who have sacrificed today, not only for those uh, themselves who, who died, but also for their families. And we pray your blessing upon all those families who are hurting and dealing with those losses today. We pray, too, for all those who have returned from war and who are now seeking uh, a place for themselves in the society um, that is not always understanding of what they've been through. And so, Lord, we pray that together as a nation that we might learn to better take care of those who have taken care of us. Lord, we are grateful today uh, for just the beauty of this day, of this season, and of the opportunities that you've given us to be together with family and friends. And as we uh, celebrate all these blessings, we pray that you help us to be mindful of all those who are hurting today, all those who are suffering and struggling today, for those who are dealing with uh, medical issues and uh, health challenges, for those who are in the hospital and those who are in uh, nursing homes and other kinds of care facilities. Would we ask your blessing? Would we pray for those that we've named here before you and all those who are on our prayer list, all those whom we name in the silence of our hearts? God, you've seen the struggles of the world this week. We pray for those who are the victims of the bombing in Manchester. We pray for uh, peace around the world. We pray for all those who uh, live under the rule of the gun. And we pray for freedom and peace and stability. We pray for people to be able to realize who they are and what you've given us. Lord, we pray that we might find a way forward as a world that is a way forward that is together, that respects people and their lives and the fact that we are all created in your image. Lord, we pray also for the church, the church in its many forms all around the world, and today especially for the church in Egypt that has suffered so much in these past few months. We ask your blessing upon those who have died and their families and ask that you would see them through this difficult time. We pray too for, these, uh, for those who offered their lives um, in defense of someone from another minority religion here in the U.S. Lord, we ask your blessing upon those families and ask you to watch over them and give them the comfort that comes from knowing you. Lord, we 
come before you recognizing that we are far, far, far from perfect, but that we've been granted this great mercy that's come to us through your son, Jesus. And because of him and because of what he's done on our behalf, we gather before you knowing that we are and can be forgiven. But we pray that you might help us now to extend that same mercy and that forgiveness to others. Help us to be peacemakers as we go forth in this place. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us go forth in this place to be peacemakers. Let us go forth to show mercy as we have been shown mercy. Let us go forth to forget, just as our sins have also been forgotten. Go forth in the power and the strength and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen.